this conference. Uh, the last two years has been the Great Lakes Analytics and Sports Conference. Uh, this year we dropped two words and added a lot more. Uh, excited to have you all here for this, uh, this conference we've got today. Uh, you don't want to hear me talk, you want to hear the experts talk, so I just have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, bathrooms, okay. Once those uh, down the hall, to the left for women, to the right for men, okay. We will be using four rooms for the talks. This room is the alumni room. 374 is down that way. 378 is down that way. 223 is down the stairs on the second level. You walk uh, along concourse, okay, in front of the Laird room, and then it's just around the corner. Okay, so 223 is the only room that we're in that's not on this floor. And then lunch will be in the legacy room, which is just down the hall, okay. Um, when we when we break for lunch, uh, there will be a line that snakes back out in the hallway a little bit, just to we ask you to be patient. Uh, we'll work through it uh, while you're in there. Uh, we will have some tables set up uh, where you can learn more about our analytics program. You can learn about, from, about uh, the program from our friends at Marquette and our friends at Century Insurance. So uh, take time to do that. Um, the Wi-Fi directions should be on the inside front cover of your program uh, on the bottom left, I believe, is where we put that. So if you have any problems, uh, just check with me or Donnie or Sheila at the uh, registration desk. And uh, just again, uh, thanks, thanks to Donnie, Sheila, uh, Marshall from Dining and Catering Services, uh, our friends at AB, uh, they've done a great job helping us pull together. So anyways, without further, further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Eduardo Rodriguez, who is our Dow Chair, uh, Century Insurance and Dow Chair in Business Analytics here at UWSB. So Eduardo, take it away. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for being here with us today. My name is Eduardo Rodriguez, I am the Central Town Chair and co-chair of the Great Lakes uh, Analytics Conference. This is an opportunity for all of us to learn, share and grow our analytics knowledge and to discover the ways of collaboration as academia and industry. Today's gathering is also to open the doors to review several analytics applications in multiple knowledge domains. In light of analytics and artificial intelligence, development AI as transformation of the pillars of our ongoing learning process and our society evolution. These three pillars are transformation in education, transformation in management, transformation in the society. First, transformation in education. Because analytics and artificial intelligence promote the use of combination of new technologies, pedagogies, and mainly we are, as professors, not just repeating lessons or lectures, because a robot can do it possibly better. And I have a little note here. If you press my button, probably you are going to have, the, instead of my Spanish accent, the black beats voice, and you have a better lecture. <laughs> Support professors to dedicate more time to improve the teaching and learning process of our diverse students. That means we need more capacity to self-learning and self-development, connecting them to the real world of business and organizations. Foster professors to be updated regarding new technologies, use of data, and analytics models that can be used in the fields of their specialty. Second, transformation in management. Because analytics and artificial intelligence impact the decision-making process, balancing intuition and reason. Reduce the time of our human intervention in areas that we can automate in order to dedicate more time to support people to perform better and to enjoy their work. That means I don't like uh, jobs as commodities. A low concentration on creative and strategic thinking, working and guiding others, developing interdisciplinary work capacity, supporting ethical and human value oriented businesses. Third, to achieve our goal of creating a smart cities, we need to develop authorities and citizens. With Analytics awareness and literacy. Analytics reasoning, analytic thinking, analytics applications, 
and analytics ethics, especially in this last one, is one of the most important these days in our society. In summary, welcome not only to a wonderful conference today, but also more importantly, to participate in the transformation of pillars of our society for tackling more complex problems and more in more efficient and effective ways. We need to be aware of controlling the technology and not the technology controlling us. In training people working collaboratively, in using new analytics-based technologies to provide more value to the society. In particular, to pay attention to the how we are going to succeed and to collaborate for using, for using analytics and artificial intelligence in the data and knowledge-driven society. Of course, given that analytics work is a collaborative one, we need to reflect on collaboration overload. That is what Dr. Bolzer is going to talk about now. Thank you and welcome and enjoy the day and I hope you can share a lot of your knowledge and your questions as well as students to every of the experts that you find in the room. Dr. Bolzer. Dr. Bolzer. He is the UPS Foundation Professor of Human Resources Management in the Organizational Behavior Unit in Harvard University School. He studies how people collaborate in teams and across organizational networks to accomplish their individual and collective goals. He has ongoing projects in collaboration with a number of organizations, often working with members of their people analytics groups in problems of mutual interest. He has taught a variety, a variety of courses in the MBA, executive and doctoral programs at Harvard Business School and published his research in numerous top management and psychology journals. A native of Wisconsin, Professor Oxley, also a earned a Bachelor of Science in Finance and Economics from the University of Wisconsin Experience Point. That is fantastic to come here as well. And an MBA from Texas Christian University. He received his PhD in Organizational Behavior from the Gallup Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, can do for organizational performance 
in terms of helping it, but also potentially harming it if you have too much collaboration. So I'm going to be getting to that, uh, some of the hypotheses, uh, I'll briefly talk about them, and then we'll get into the data for sure. But to begin, I want to um, just give a brief overview of this field of people analytics. Uh, and let me ask, it also goes by the, by the um, uh, terms talent analytics, human resource analytics, workforce analytics, there are a lot of different, uh, different uh, terms for it. How many people have heard of this field? All right, great. So close to half, uh, not everyone. Um, so let me give a brief overview of the field of people analytics. There's a lot going on. Data science and big data have come to HR and management in a big way. And the wave is just beginning. Uh, so there's a ton of opportunity in this field. I've been talking to lots of organizations. I've been teaching uh, an elective course to our MBA students at Harvard Business School on people analytics. Uh, we're starting to teach the executive programs on people analytics, and there's a lot of research occurring uh, in this field. In organizations, in academia, and in uh, collaboration between those two. So, uh, let's, let's get into it. And by the way, raise your hand, ask questions, fire away at any point. Uh, I'd love to make this a little more interactive. We've got a lot of material, but I'll uh, take responsibility for pushing my way through. So first, uh, thing is a shout out to my collaborators, Evan, he's a little bit of a doctoral student in our organization, the leader department in Madison, I'm sure a research associate. They've done a ton of work uh, with me uh, to, to uh, make this research happen. So uh, shout out to them. People analytics, I think that as a data-driven approach to employee-related practices and decisions. Um, so lots of organizations have um, great analytics work going on on the consumer side, on the operations side, in the finance department, uh, and other spheres. And often the HR department is, has data, but is not using it very rigorously, is not using it in, in um, predictive ways, in ways that it could to improve the way people make decisions, the efficiency with, with, with which they make decisions, um, and in the ways they, they affect day-to-day -day, uh, workflows and performance of, of employees. That's changing fast. Okay, so um, let's, let's take a quick look at what is involved in, um, in people analytics. This is what I call people analytics version one. So lots of organizations uh, have the HR department, general managers throughout the organization, and employees, uh, they traditionally you know, work together uh, in various ways. Uh, a classic story that I've heard over and over in organizations is that someone outside of HR, uh, often, who has some analytics chops, somebody in a manager in engineering, somebody in consumer analytics, somebody in finance, uh, is, is risen in the management ranks and is having some, some issue, some business issue around turnover is typical, or around hiring. And they say, hey, why don't we use data in more sophisticated ways to help us make hiring decisions, or to figure out, to try to predict who's most at risk of leaving the organization. We have the sort of data, why don't we do more of this? Um, often an ad hoc project arises. That person might talk to HR, pull in some people from the business unit, pull in a data scientist from someone in the organization, and do a project around employee retention, or do a project around hype, and maybe do some predictive analytics. Uh, and, and if that goes well, they move on to another project, and pretty soon a people analytics group is born in the organization. Um, often aligned with the human resource department, uh, and often having some dedicated data scientists. So we've seen this uh, over and over. Lots of organizations are, are uh, I've either started doing this at this point or, or have plans to begin doing this. And the, the typical use cases early on have to do with the employee life cycle. Uh, so hiring and retention of employees are often the kind of gateways into people analytics. But we see um, modeling and algorithmic approaches to promotions, who should be in the consideration set when a, when a position opens up to be considered for promotion. So let's model. Uh, the workforce that we have, the flows of employees, looking at things like employee engagement, uh, performance management, 
feedback, compensation. Lots of data are being used to inform um, these, uh, these kinds of episodic uh, decisions and practices. Okay? It's often a team sport. You need somebody who understands the business. You need somebody who understands HR. You need some statisticians and data scientists. Often you have translators, people that know enough about the data science and enough about the business to kind of be the interface between the two. Uh, you often see teams of people doing this work to bring lots of those skills to bear. Um, classic, uh, what we think of as HR data is often the starting point. Um, often it needs to be digitized, cleaned, joined. Lots of time and effort goes into actually getting the data into, into good shape to be used. So you see there's lots of just descriptive reporting at the beginning of the, the, the sort of people analytics journal. And then you get into some predictive modeling. And you get into the use of the output of these models with people throughout the organization who are involved in hiring. Or the managers of people who are managing the people that you think might leave the company. And so then you're, you, you start to say, okay, how do we communicate the results? How do we visualize them? How do we get people to use the output of the models that we're doing? So lots of work going on in this area. And it has spawned a cottage industry. Okay, so lots of signals of the rise of people in the place. Um, all kinds of people uh, writing books, consulting, writing articles about it. Uh, if you look at Google searches for people analytics, it's interesting that it's only 2012. Uh, so 10 years ago, very little of this was going on. Uh, Google was at the forefront of it. There were some tech firms doing this for sure, but not much. And now we're starting to see uh, the rise of um, data science applied to management and HR. Um, <clears throat> this slide could have you know, we could have many, many slides of companies doing this kind of work. But a couple, a couple highlights. One is, you'll see big companies. They have lots of data. Uh, a lot of this started in, in tech firms, uh, but now Wall Street, consulting firms, uh, people analytics groups. Um, uh, and a couple, a couple uh, things to note. One is, plenty of startups. So there's a whole startup ecosystem now around new technologies trying to help companies with their people analytics projects. Venture capitalists are looking at a lot of funding now for these types of startups in the world of people analytics. It's not just another thing, it's not just big companies, it's nonprofits, Teach for America, um, some of the other nonprofits who, I used to think we had to have a lot of slack and a lot of cash and money to do this. And some of the nonprofits are telling me, we have to do it because we have to be more efficient. So we need to do predictive modeling to figure out how to allocate our time and attention. So that's kind of interesting. And then, of course, the money ball, we have Oakland Athletics. I could, I could put many, many sports teams up here. Um, and I know this was a, a sports uh, theme conference last year. Uh, people analytics, in many ways, has its roots in sports analytics, in money ball, which is, in many ways, talent analytics. It's trying to figure out you know, if it's your baseball talent or your football talent or your basketball talent. Um, I will say, I've got my home team, Boston Celtics, up here, but I've become a Bucks fan uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so, uh, when I go back to the days of like Bob Lavier and Stephen Martin, okay. Um, so lots of companies using this. You know that something is catching on when even the academics start teaching about it. Okay, so we so we've got this people analytics course. Uh, it's an elective course in the MBA program at Harvard. Last spring, 110 of our students signed up and took the People Analytics course um, at, at HBS. And lots of other schools are now starting uh, to offer People Analytics courses in there. But so far, to me, that's exciting. But, but the most uh, exciting and interesting stuff is what's coming. And that is because uh, we're moving from episodic decisions to, um, to the day-to-day -day workflows of organizations, all right, to things like collaboration and teamwork and ongoing feedback and performance management. Um, these things that aren't, don't occur once a quarter or once a year. 
hiring a hiring cycle or, or a, a bonus cycle, but occur every day all the time. And one of the things that's feeding this are new digital data sources. So instead of just thinking about resumes as a source of data or HR records, think about all of the unstructured data that we create every time we sit at a computer or blow our phone. Okay? And it clearly goes, you know, can go into the Immediately, you start to think privacy issues, um, legal issues, um, what's cool versus what's creepy. Uh, that's all in play in this new world of people analytics, for sure. Um, but uh, location: where are your employers? If you have a new building, you decide who you know who who you want next to each other to work. Who needs to work together most? Uh, we, we can think about what are what are the physical flow of people. What is the physical people around the, the workplace? Um, any te text and chats or emails can be mined uh, for all kinds of um, metrics. Uh, vocal cues, uh, can, we're talking about calendars today. So who's meeting with whom in the organization? How are people spending their time? If everybody's on the same calendar system, uh, you have tons of data on those uh, aspects of people's data. Uh, and same with video, uh, face recognition, there are all kinds of digital flows of data um, that are, are working their way through organizations on not just day-to-day -day basis, but a minute-to-day -day basis. So this is, a, this is where I'm going to switch from an overview of people analytics into the research project that I'm going to tell you about. But it's, it's going to tap into some of these digital forms of data, in particular email and, and calendar as proxies or indicators of collaboration among people in the firms. Um, and uh, so to do that, the research question um, I'm going to ask, let me just make sure. Um, I have my clock here. Otherwise, I'll, I'll uh, be with you here all day to talk about it. Um, so, um, the research question, how do collaboration patterns affect organizational performance? Um, the organizations, some of the organizations I've been working with are um, very interested in this question. They want to know how people are spending their time. They have formal systems to track that, but they realize that the formal systems they have uh, are ca capturing only a portion of people's activities. So think about an organization chart, a reporting relationship where people have a boss, you gather information, and the boss you know, tracks what you're doing and tells you what to do. That uh, captures some of the activity in organizations. If you go to some of the tech firms, for example, depending on what function you're in for sure, people are working on lots of different collaborative activities. They're coming up with their own projects. Uh, they're getting asked for help by people across the organization, having meetings with people that aren't anywhere near the new work chart. Uh, so organizations are asking, like, how can we understand actually what's going on in our organization? And some of the, the digital data leave trails of activity that they're trying to tap into or, or, or have the, the opportunity to tap into to understand where, who's, who's talking to who, who's meeting with who, uh, how are people spending their time. And when some of the, the work that's been done internally in some organizations shows that the formal reporting systems capture maybe half of the activity in the organization. But there's another half of people's time doesn't show up in the formal reporting structures. So these are the kind of these, these data can, can potentially help us understand patterns of collaboration uh, and how they affect organizational performance. Alright, so let's talk about collaboration. Um, there's a uh, there has been a trend toward more collaboration across lots of industries. And there's lots of there are lots of forces at work that are driving. And in some ways, it's old news. Okay, so there's lots of reasons. There's lots of writing about it. 
uh, lots of research on the benefits of collaboration. Uh, and the idea is for lots of organizations, we need more collaboration and better collaboration to drive organizational performance. Uh, so we start to reward it. We start to encourage it. And everybody starts to collaborate. Uh, and in many cases, we see more uh, you know, improvement in performance uh, as a result. Okay. So that's great. We're all good to go. Uh, and by the way, we draw on sports teams. So look at, look, let's, let's talk about teamwork you know, within teams. Let's talk about networks and how to go collaborate across the organizational network. Um, but in this talk, what I want to focus on is a problem that keeps creeping up uh, and that I keep hearing about when people say, yeah, uh, collaboration is great, but all I do all day is meet with people from one meeting to the next. And then when I'm done with my meetings, all I do is go back to my desk and answer an email. Uh, and I can't, how many people have an inbox that's uh, overflowing? Uh, I would encourage you not to worry about answering emails right now during my talk. Uh, but you, you might have time at the break to catch up. Um, so this, this question I look at, collaboration is great. It can, it can uh, integrate our activity across the organization. Um, but how does it get done, and what are the potentially harmful consequences? So we're going to focus today on two um, uh, uh, conduits of a mechanism for collaborative meetings, uh, email, with the caveat that, of course, there are many different ways to collaborate. Everywhere, everything from hallway conversations to formal reporting uh, um, mechanisms and organizations where people need to write up reports tell other people what's going on. There are uh, collaboration platforms, uh, web-enabled web platforms, all kinds of ways to collaborate. I'm just focusing on these two things today. Uh, but we'll see where we can get with these. And there's lots of research uh, and writing, of course, on the benefits of meetings, why they are really helpful for important decisions. On uh, the, the benefits of email, for being able to correspond to people quickly across you know, a wide geographical range. And, um, and, and obviously, email meetings are everywhere. Okay, so these are great. The question is, are they helpful? Uh, and if we go from our previous slides saying collaboration uh, improves performance, and meetings and email are two common mechanisms for collaborating, then it should follow that more meetings and email improve performance. Um, but you can see where I'm going. Uh, with the idea that, you know, what, what are the limits to, to more and more meetings of people in collaboration. And um, we have a paper that I'd be happy to send you, uh, I'm going to give you an email, uh, on this, this topic. Which we've, we've written up a lot of the reasons why we think uh, email meetings uh, could potentially have diminishing returns and even negative returns. Um, and, but I just want to share a couple with you. One is uh, that as your overloaded inbox is a test, emails and meetings can drive out the focus time for individual work. Whatever responsibilities you have, you probably need some time to do that work. And if all you're doing is running around a meeting, you can answer emails, you can crowd out the time to do that. Some people get, uh, become central hubs of collaboration uh, and, and get asked to do more and more of that. They get burned up. Uh, they can leave the organization when you're not just turnover. Um, question. Uh, sorry for that. You know, the thing is, I don't have a watch anymore because I just use my phone all the time. It's great until you compare a situation like this where you don't have a watch anymore. Um, so, the best collaboration can become bottlenecks. Uh, and then there are lots of other things that happen. People are in multiple teams. Well, switching costs are real. So I get scattered. And, you know, I, I do one thing for a little while, I do another thing. That can actually be draining, and, um, and I don't do my best work. Full calendars delay important meetings. I don't know if you've been in a situation and said, oh, here's an urgent issue. The six of us need to get together. Let's find a time. All right, the next time we all have available jointly is six weeks from now for a half hour. All right, so full calendars can actually be kind of like sand in the gears of the organization. It's 
a friction that slows everything down. Um, so, and, and why would people do this in this back view? I think it's actually really hard individually to calibrate how much you should, you should uh, collaborate. If you're an academic, think about research projects. How many, what's the right number of research projects to have? It's easy to jump in and help and begin things. It's harder to close them out. Uh, and we're notoriously bad at estimating how long things will take and how much, uh, how coordination costs can creep in. Okay, so there are lots of problems in, in asking people to calibrate for themselves the right amount of collaboration. I think it leads to these, these kind of problems. All right, so a hypothesis is uh, a relatively simple one. that we take meeting hours, for example. Uh, as the number of meetings go up, you know, increases in an organization, we should see improvements to performance because collaboration is helpful. But the argument is that that will eventually lead to diminishing returns, and if overdone too much, it will actually hurt organizational performance. And we can substitute emails in there. Uh, if we have data on other forms of collaboration, we can substitute those in and look at them jointly. The basic idea is that collaboration is good up to a point, uh, and then it's going to hurt performance. Okay, it's in the methods. All right. Um, so we're working with a, 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 a global tech company um, that I'm not allowed in writing to say their name, but uh, it's going to be for, they offer an email and electronic calendar, cloud-based platform for their customers. So lots of organizations use their platform for their email and uh, technology. All right, so we, from them, they have, they have um, hundreds of thousands of customers, and we formed a collaborative data sharing agreement with them. Uh, as an aside, it took a couple of years to put this in place with Harvard's Office of General Counsel, working with their lawyers, with our Institutional Review Board, working with them, uh, because these are sensitive data, for sure. And so you'll see that in the second bullet point, the word de-identified is in there multiple times. To stress the idea that we took lots and lots of pains to make sure that we were using the data in a responsible way. And yet, in a way that we can learn something from the fact that all these data are, are, are out there. So they provided us calendar and email data at the level of the firm, and I'll tell you about that, uh, for the year 2016. We just got data um, 2017 and 2018 that were in the process of analyzing the table in 2016. Okay. Um, so we had meeting and email data from these firms, but we wanted performance as well. So we, the, the company matched, got uh, data from Dun Bradstreet, a uh, firm that collects all kinds of um, performance data from, from the companies. We got firm revenue, employee count, and some other things like industry uh, um, that firms are in from Dun & Bradstreet. The, the tech company matched these data with their email and calendar data, de-identified all of them, and then gave us the data. We continue to work with the tech company And we did things like, you know, in terms of data part, revenue and employee count, because if you know revenue for 2016, you can look up what company that is. Uh, so they took the sample they had, logged revenue, and then mean center as a technical detail, which, which that means that we can't look at a particular firm revenue number for one observation and know what company it is. So um, lots of steps are taken there. Essentially what we're doing is using digital data measure collaborative activity at scale. Uh, so we have lots of companies. Uh, in particular, in this, in this study, I'll be talking about 216,096 firms across 168 countries. Uh, and what we have are, are observations for each firm. If you, if you back out the number of individuals that have sent emails or been in meetings that contribute to these aggregate numbers, there's about around 18 million individuals that um, have sent an email or participated in a meeting that is part of the aggregation. Um, 
And as an aside, this is a subset uh, for them to be matched with the Dun & Bradstreet data. Uh, there are over, well, there's one company has, there's over a million firms that use their platform. Uh, so, so it's a pretty mind-boggling amount of data. For, for, anyway, for somebody in the organizational behavior at business school, who's used to doing social psychology experiments, I you know you guys are using big data in lots of ways, but for me this is kind of a sound. Um, <laughs> And I'm learning all kinds of new things about how to actually analyze data like this. Um, I'm looking forward to today's sessions to help with that. Um, so just quickly some um, descriptives. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you can see these are, have been standardized. Um, email sent per user per week is the metric. 21 on average across all 200,000 firms. Meeting hours per year per week, the mean is only three, which to me is like way low. Uh, when you talk to these people, it turns out there's huge variation across function, across industry, across country. And we're starting to tap into those sources of variation to understand different patterns on how, how do people think about meetings as a way to collaborate in different uh, industries, countries, etc. Average meeting size across all of those companies is 5.8. Okay, so you start to see things like, yeah, if you're in a five-person meeting or a six-person meeting, yep, that's a pretty typical one. Right? That's, that's uh, uh, pretty standard. All right, um, so uh, I, I want to say most of the companies are from the U.S. Over 100,000 firms are from the U.S. And then the second most are from the U.K. and Canada. But there's pretty wide representation we're going to actually do some analysis of, of national culture, uh, the influence of national culture on the propensity to use meetings or email in different ways. Okay. Um, let's see. So the analytical approach, just to dip into this for a second. So the outcome is firm revenue. This is cross-sectional. We have causality issues for sure, um, but we're looking at relationships for uh, and, and we're trying to see what we can do about it. Getting some longitudinal data. But for now, we've got firm revenue for 2016. And then our, our key independent variable, for example, this model is meeting hours per user per week. Uh, and then we have controls for the size of the company, as far as my employee count, whether it's multinational or not, by industry it's in, the year it started. It turns out the start year actually affects propensity to be a meeting. If you're in a company that was founded, before 1970, uh, versus one that was founded in 2007, controlling for size and industry, you actually have an effect for how, how many meetings or emails you send. So there are these legacy, it appears there are these kind of legacy influences to uh, so control for those. Um, and again, just to go into the, um, the details, we're, we're looking at the main effect for meeting hours and a, a quadratic or square term for to, to look at this inverted U-shaped uh, effect, this curvilinear effect. And what we, want, what we would expect is that if, if, if we see this pattern, we would expect the coefficient of regression for meeting hours to be positive, and the squared term to be negative. So at low level of meeting hours, it's a positive effect, and then as meeting hours increases and that squared term kicks in and is negative, you'll see the, the diminishing returns and then the negative returns. So that's, that's what we're going to be looking for analytically uh, in the regression. What do you think we found? Support? Yes, I would be yes. presenting this to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you some of these regressions um, as kind of an example. So uh, here is the effect of meeting hours on firm revenue. So our, our dependent variable's revenue is the OL and ordinary least squares regression. And then the square regression. We have these controls in here that are, are not shown. But here's our meeting hours coefficient, which is, is positive and significant. Uh, and then our quadratic term, which is negative uh, and significant. So that's, that fits the pattern that we were hypothesizing. Um, but it leaves a question of what does this actually look like? So the, the, the graph of this um, um, regression equation, it? Uh, it looks exactly like this. The 
And apologies, these blue lines for some reason do show up all the way through. But this is the line of the um, of that regression. And you can see it, it fits the shape. Um, and the, the inflection point, average meeting hours are around, I think it's 15 hours per week per person on average. Overall, across all these numbers, is when you start to see, you've already had diminishing returns at that point, and then you start to see it. Yes? I was just curious, since this goes all the way up to 40 in your observations, how many companies were you having at yeah. 20 to 40 meeting hours per employee per week? Yeah, not many, but uh, I actually have a scatter plot. Uh, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, good question. But, you know, not that many, but because the sample's so big, you actually have, you know, quite a few companies. What's that? I said, having any at all over there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're looking at, we're talking to the company, we're saying, like, what's going on here? So these are small companies, you know, small firms with four people. Like, what? How are they using their their um, their calendar system? You know, like is this just some aberrant data? But we're, we've done what we're doing is a whole bunch of robust robustness checks, so you can look at each decile of meetings of, of employee size, employee count, and this curvilinear effect seems to hold in each decile. So even for just the big firms, we still see it, um, and you know you get different inflection points and things like that, but. But the, the pattern seems to be pretty, uh, pretty robust. And we describe all of these different tests we've done in this paper in the appendix. Uh, if, you need, if you need help getting to sleep tonight, I recommend the appendix. Uh, all right, so let's look at emails. Um, the uh, same pattern, you get a, you get a significant main effect and a, um, a negative uh, square term. If you look at the um, curve here, uh, you see the inflection point is around 100 emails sent per person per week. So you think, oh, that's a lot, but then five working is that's 20 per day. It's not that, uh, you know, for, for lots of people. Um, and one thing we're doing now is getting more data on the dispersion within companies. Because part of what we're hearing from our data providers is that when they talk to their customers, they say, well, there are lots of use, lots of employees with email and calendar accounts. Some of them are in a manufacturing line. They have virtually you know, very few emails. But then if you go to the sales force or the managers, they have way more than this. So there's a lot of dispersion that we're trying to understand. Because this is just the overall pattern. So, um, the next thing we did was we said, well, what about, what if you combine meeting hours and emails? Like it might be the combination of lots of meetings and lots of emails that really uh, cause a problem. And so we, we controlled for the effects that we just saw, which still are, are significant. It's not as huge sample size, significant size. And then we interact these to look at both uh, the inflection point, where that changes, uh, when we look at meeting hours and performance based on the number of emails and the steepness of the curve. And uh, both things are significant. I'm going to show you the chart of this. So this is average meeting hours per person per week on record, same as that first graph. But now we've divided it into firms that are relatively high on emails, sent, which is a little low on emails. Sent. So the the problem becomes worse for meeting hours when you're in an organization that also sends lots of emails. So if you're high on emails and high on meetings, that's when the overload especially damages performance. The inflection point now is less than that 15 hours. Uh, I think it's about 12 hours. When we start to cut the data in different ways, when we start looking at industry now as well, you can see this problem it's not the same everywhere. Uh, and, uh, so that's, that's a kind of thing. So the last effect I'm going to show you is um, on multitasking. And so I mentioned before, if you have emails, you know, hold off on, on answering them while you're in, the, in this talk. Well, it turns out lots of people actually respond to emails while they're in meetings. <laughs> I know none of you have ever done that. Okay, I'm assuming you have. 
30 minutes. Uh, but um, these emails and meeting hours are all time stamped. Uh, so you can look at the, the, the propensity for people in a firm to send emails during meetings. Okay, so the data provider worked with them and they did a data poll where they did just that. They, they looked at each meeting and said of the people in the meeting, how many of them sent emails that were time stamped during that meeting. And we'll call that multitasking. Alright, so identify email sent during meetings. And then for each meeting, measure the proportion of people who sent emails during that meeting. Alright, uh, and then average for each meeting of a proportion, and average that across all the meetings in the firm, and see whether that um, affects performance. And you can make a case, as some people have made, that look, this is a matter of efficiency. Like I'm sitting in a meeting, there's a part of the meeting I don't really need to do. Pay attention to or I can pay attention while I'm sending emails, it's more efficient. Okay? It's also distracting potentially. There's a question whether you need to be in that meeting if you don't need to pay attention. Um, it can be distracting to others. It can also potentially have a second order effect of creating a norm in the organization that you can be at meetings, but you don't have to be fully engaged. And if that takes hold, uh, you know, that could be another mechanism through which this multitasking behavior actually just to hurt performance um, at kind of a micro level and, and, and at the level. So we used our we did a measure of multitasking. The main effect was positive. Uh, then we put it in a square term, it was negative. Uh, and this is controlling for meeting hours of email, you know, the, the number of meeting hours of emails. Um, and you see that after a little bit of a rise at the beginning, uh, there's uh, a negative effect where you have too many people in too many meetings sending emails while they're from the city. So this thing. This is potentially interesting, uh, or you may find it potentially interesting to see what, what other readers think. I think it's also a, a, um, an example of the kinds of things you can do with data libraries. Is that you, there are lots of parameters that digitally you have access to. And, and the question is like, well, what are the issues you think are going on in the organization? What's interesting from a research perspective? And how can we use these types of measures to get at these questions in new ways that we weren't able to do before. Okay, um, so you see some support for this idea of collaboration overload. Um, right now, we're, we're, we have meeting hours, but we know the size of meetings, how many people were there, we know the length of meetings, and we know the number of meetings. So meeting hours has to be a function of those, you know, total meeting hours per person. It has to be a function of those three parameters. But you can imagine in different configurations. Some companies have really long meetings uh, with few people. Some people have really big meetings, but not very, you know, very many. So there's a question of, of trying to figure out effective configurations uh, of these three parameters. And that and uh, the doctor's been working with is using some um, random forest models and some machine learning techniques to try to sort out the, um, the kind of landscape of these parameters in terms of what, you know, what are configurations that work best. Um, so, uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, one thing we're going to look, kind of just look at internal network structure. Uh, and how, you know, how clustered are people in terms of their meetings versus meeting people across the organization. Um, but I also want to think about <clears throat> team and individual levels of analysis. So this is high level, aggregating the firm. To me, it raises tons of questions about what's actually going on in these firms. And we're working with a couple of individual firms to look at more uh, micro patterns of interaction among individuals and within teams to see what does collaboration look like at the, you know, for individual people that are experiencing it and for the teams that are to try to gain more insight into this, this slide. Yes? What happened if you change your target variable from value to like netting or some measure like that? 
Right, yeah, great question. We're, um, we're actually looking into uh, getting other metrics of performance for exactly that reason. Uh, and we started with revenue, and we actually we were also looking at our productivity, which is revenue divided by the employee count, uh, which is something that I think economists use and some economists suggest that. But we're, but this question has come before exactly, and so okay, let's, let's, let's also branch right now. First, as somebody who's about the same age as you, I've got to compliment you on your restraint and using the word collaborate too many times without referencing vanilla ice. Uh, because <laughs> that was just running through my mind the whole hey, time. All right. Um, We've got a little vanilla ice break over there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll stop collaborating and listen yeah. later. Um, the second question Do you see a distinction or have you thought about creating a distinction between in person meetings versus virtual meetings? Because um, I wonder if that would affect the variables at all. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, we actually have data from another company on um, teams. And what we've done, they, they surveyed all their teams on some of the team dimensions. And what we did is, so let's take that survey data. And for each individual team, we, we went back six months and gathered calendar data for those individuals. Um, and said, okay, how many meetings did occur on different subsets or the whole team or individuals? And part of that is to say, where did the meeting occur? And, and um, how many rooms, how many locations are included in the meeting? So if, if we're you know, trying to get at that kind of thing, and say, are, are people co-located? Are they interacting virtually? And how does, you know, how does that work? So lots of possibilities there. there as well. Yes? The thought that comes to mind is I have meetings on my calendar all the time that I don't go to, or meetings that are staff where I have three different meetings I'm supposed to be in at the same time. And your 40 hours a week of meeting. Well, yeah, and, and so meeting, we initially started using meeting count, and we realized that so many people are double booked and triple booked, but the meeting hours metric, uh, which is explained in the paper, what we did is we, the, the data provider went through, and for each person they said, okay, let's look at every minute of their week, and ask, is there a meeting booked for that minute? And whether it's one meeting, two meetings, or three meetings, all we're just doing is saying, is that a minute taken up by so, so double and triple booking is another thing that, that I think we're dealing with when we start looking at meeting times. Jeff, two more, two more questions. Two more questions? Okay, great. So it's indirectly related to collaboration, but are you looking at the total number of hours worked a week? Because um, it's actually not unusual to be in meetings for 40 hours a week because you're working 60. Yes. And that impacts productivity in yes. as well. Yeah, totally. And, and, and what they went with timestamps, uh, in fact, the company with their customers is starting to provide them with a metric of, um, um, I want to forget what they call it, but it's, it's emails sent and meetings attended outside of normal working hours. And the company can define, okay, like eight to five, nine to five, and say those five days a week, those are normal working hours. How much of this activity is occurring outside of those meeting hours? Is that associated with employee burnout, disengagement? So you can use those timestamps in lots of interesting ways to look for patterns like that. Yes? Uh, were you able to look at, um, you know, for the people who send emails in meetings, how many, what percentage send emails to other people in the same meeting? Uh, uh, we haven't looked at that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of possibilities um, for that kind of thing. Uh, on that, actually, text messaging one another in a meeting. Yeah. I, it is more common. Yeah, and it might actually connect to virtual meetings too to say like, you know, in, in bigger meetings. So when you have a bigger meeting and you say like, hey, I have something to say, but I can't get it in because somebody else is dominating the airtime. They will just fire off an email out of the chat. So the, the digital world we're in, all of that uh, is traceable. In fact, some companies that are looking at meetings with, you know, you've heard of Alexa at work. Well, not just the written texts and emails during meetings, but also to say, Let's look at airtime. You know, let's let's look at who's talking when, and it can immediately again get into privacy and you know all those kinds of issues. But these things are all now possible in the world of people like this. And um, to me, it's a fascinating world. It's, it's been uh, a pleasure to share some of this with you now, and I look forward to 
the rest of the day. And I'm going to put my, um, my thank you slide in, in the purple and gold of UWC. Thank you very much.